Good afternoon and welcome to the, our Posturite Friday webinar. Today, back by popular demand, we have John Ridd from JRP Ergonomics and he's representing his active working in the office webinar that he presented a couple of weeks ago. We had a lot of people wanting um, to hear this presentation again and some people were having difficulties using the watch again function, hence we decided to put this on again today. As usual, we will be re-recording this webinar and that will be uh, available on our website. So I'm hoping that, that you'll enjoy it again today. If you wish to ask any questions, um, please feel free to do that by typing them into the panel on the right hand side of your screen and submit them. And I will try and get through as many of them as I can at the end of the session. So really nothing left really for me to do apart from to hand over to John and for the active working in the office session. Over to you, John. Okay, thank you, Catherine, for that and good afternoon, everyone. Um, there may be some confusion as well in that uh, we have titled this particular presentation Active Working in the Office, whereas before it was uh, entitled, I think, To Sit or To Stand and so forth so that uh, we can distinguish it on the list of uh, recordings if you want to come back to this at a later stage. Um, but essentially this is going to be uh, the same presentation that was given earlier but with a few updates to take account of some of the questions that were asked uh, following that uh, webinar. So um, let's, let's have a look at, uh, at, at the issues that we're talking about here. The, the problem as I see it is that essentially we, we employ people and as we know everyone is different and there are so many variables that we, we all come with if you like that there is no possibility of a one size fits all approach to uh, office working and essentially I suppose in the, uh, the start of all this that's why we actually do employ people. Um, they're flexible they're adaptable and we bring with us to the workplace a valuable set of skills. Trouble is that once, once we've got these people in the workplace, once we've recruited them, we stick them in front of a computer and we ask them to process data. We, we don't really allow them to use those skills for which we employed them in the first place. Why then, I would ask, are we surprised that they often become stressed and fatigued and perhaps this, this itself leads to uh, some sort of ill health condition. Now, I'm not alone in, in recognizing that, I think we probably all do, but there's been an increasing amount of, of research over recent years looking into the effect of this on particularly on sedentary workers. And I think at the moment there's a fairly well publicized study going on um, with Richard Branson's Virgin Company where they are looking at the effect of uh, sedentary work and how it can be changed. Now, some of this research uh, has shown us that we spend between 9 and 11 hours seated each day. Worryingly, over 60% of that time is seated time which occurs in the office. And interestingly, it's been found that gym membership may not be the answer. So yes, I'm not trying to suggest that it's no, not worthwhile going to the gym at lunchtime or indeed after work. Um, but it doesn't properly compensate uh, for the time that if you spend prolonged sitting time at work, it doesn't properly compensate for that uh, length of time uh, in a, a static posture. Well, why would, should we worry about that? sitting down is nice and comfortable? Well, we should be concerned because the research tells us that sedentary postures, if you like, or muscular inactivity comes with increased risks for various health problems. And muscular, for muscular inactivity, I would ask you to read prolonged sitting. So we're talking about people who spend not just 30 minutes, but hours sat at their desk during the day. Some people have said that sitting at your desk for a long time and being inactive, um, your met metabolism actually stops. Well, that 
clearly isn't the case. Um, but what it does do is slow down. And low energy expenditure can lead to fat down and used, used by the body. If we don't need energy for exercise, for activity, then the metabolism doesn't convert the fats into the energy sources. So instead of getting used up, it leads to an accumulation of fats in the viscera. We get an increase in triglycerides in the blood, an increase in cholesterol. All this can result in an increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Now, prolonged sitting has also been associated with increased risks in type 2 diabetes. Also, for increased risks for different cancers, um, lung cancer, womb cancer, and colorectal, I think, have been the ones that have been identified as particularly associated as being there being an increased risk um, for sedentary activity. And the area that I'm more familiar with, uh, as my particular background is musculoskeletal ergonomics, um, is in the area where prolonged sitting leads to a number of musculoskeletal problems such as uh, the discs, the intervertebral discs becoming compressed when you sit still for a long period. Back muscles become fatigued if we're sitting still. All muscles become fatigued if they're not used. We need to uh, activate the muscles. We need to flex and uh, contract muscles in order to get the blood pumping through them. And if we don't do that regularly, then those muscles become fatigued. When we then try and do something active, such as, I don't know, reaching over to the, the, the shelves behind your desk to pick up a, a ring binder, heavy ring binder, then if the muscles are fatigued, that can be enough to strain those muscles. I think we're all so well aware of the um, edema problems with the collection of fluid in the lower limbs and in the feet if we, if we sit still for long periods. And standing and walking helps to pump the fluids, pump the blood around the body. Now, the research that's been going on suggests that all of these problems that I've been talking about significantly increase if our daily sitting time goes beyond seven and a half hours. There is also uh, a school of thought, if you like, that suggests that it may even be as low as uh, sitting time of as much as six hours. So it doesn't, if you like, it doesn't take a lot before these increases in risk come about. So should we change from sitting to standing when we're at work? Well, it's not really that simple. It never is, is it? Prolonged standing is also associated with increased risks. Varicose veins, back and neck pain, leg and hip discomfort. So we're on a hiding to nothing, really. We can't win. Or can we? I think, firstly, we need to keep a sense of proportion. Um, the, the cancers that I was talking about that have an increased risk associated with sedentary work. Um, well, the research suggests that there is about an, in, an increase to 30% um, for those uh, conditions. And that can be pretty alarming. But we need to understand the, what's behind these figures, really. Because this is measured against a baseline risk of getting those problems. Now, I don't actually know what the baseline risk for lung, womb, or, or colorectal cancer is, but there was a recent report um, dealing with breast cancer and the increased risk as a result of uh, taking hormone replacement therapy. And it was said to be about 60%, which is pretty startling, pretty frightening, I think. But that is also calculated on this baseline risk. And the baseline risk of getting breast cancer for females is about 1%. So by taking HRT, that increases your risk to just 1.6%. And 
Now this is still worrying, but it's certainly less alarming than the 60% figure. And that's the same in those conditions that are being where there is an increased risk being created by the sedentary activity. Although we talk about perhaps a 30% increase in the risk of the condition, that is really probably a much lower level for the general uh, in reality um, when set against the baseline levels. Now there will be a lot of people that don't really want to publicize that side of the issue. They want the, heart, the headline figures to be there to frighten people into making changes. But I think, as a musculoskeletal specialist, if you like, that the, the risks for back pain and uh, neck pain and so forth uh, are just as important. And these are the ones that will be overcome by making these changes, as well as these perhaps, I would say, lesser risks of these other conditions. So movement and exercise is the key here to all of this. But I think particularly you will benefit from improved musculoskeletal conditions or reduction in the existence or the occurrence of those. So if we need to exercise, how much exercise do we need to do? Well, for years now we've been talking about uh, perhaps 30 minutes a day, five days a week, 150 minutes a week of, of some sort of exercise. Um, but I think that's quite hard for a lot of people to achieve that. And what they've also been trying to include gradually over the, the years has been to recognize that we need to minimize our seating time. And recently, what's been proposed is that we should have two hours a day standing or is spent in light activity. And if we can, then to progress that to four hours. And that should inc be included during the assembly periods, if you like. So we should interrupt uh, sitting at work with as many periods as we can of standing or light activity work. And that way they hope, we hope, to increase our, our active time to, to more than four hours a day. How can it be achieved? Well, we should have been looking at this for many years now. Back in 1999, there was an international standard uh, which dealt with this matter. And it said that the standing posture is recommended if it can alternate with a sitting position. That's really what we're talking about now. It also said the work surface should be height adjustable. That's almost publicized these days as being a new idea. It's certainly not. So what about adjustable height desks? Well, personally, I think they're an excellent idea. I'm, I'm, I'm standing in front of one now. They have the same footprint as the ordinary desk. And yet the individual is in control of when they change their posture and in what way they change their posture, so the height that they want. And provided it's uh, electronically adjustable, then it has uh, or it removes the risk, as some of the desks have, of having to be manually wound up and down. Now, that's not necessarily a bad thing, other than if you provided that desk to the person uh, on the basis of them uh, having back trouble and needing to have a, an adjustable height desk, and then they can perhaps, uh, they might injure themselves as a result of winding that desk up and down. So we have to have some caution here and uh, to, to understand the, the benefits of these. You don't have to go for the uh, height adjustable desk necessarily in, the, in that sense, but you can have this sort of retrofit system, which is a module that uh, you can put on an existing desk and the keyboard level can be lowered to be desk level or it can be raised so that you can stand at this item. And these are very popular at the moment. Whatever you're doing, when you are standing, you need also to maintain or to include some movement. I would suggest that something like a footrest uh, to be used when you're standing, as we do when we're sitting. And just to put one leg up at a time so that you get a change of balance at your hips, change the, the, the static loading on the legs and so forth, and therefore get some movement into those legs while you are actually in the standing position. That doesn't mean that I would go as far as to say have uh, um, one of the um, 
treadmill desks. And we'll come back to that a bit later. Along with the, uh, the bringing in of the height adjustable desk, there is now software available which prompts you, which there's a pop-up comes up on the screen that prompts you to change uh, your posture. So you can set it to the times that you want to change and so forth. When you want to go from a sitting to a standing position, this will pop up and enable you to make or help you to make that decision. It, this particular software allows you to do it from the keyboard. I'm not sure whether that's necessary, but it, it's, it's, it's a nice idea. That said, I'm not completely won over yet, as I think rather than having this set to determine when uh, things should happen. I think the decision should be left to the individual. When they feel it's the time to stand up or to sit down, that's when it should happen. Though, if you get stuck into the work and forget about that, the posture you're in, then having this pop-up come up can be a useful idea. Some of the resistance or arguments that have been made recently are that we ergonomists have actually contributed to this, to this problem by providing people with comfortable chairs. And I would say that there's a, a sort of misunderstanding of the ergonomics approach, if that's their view. Yes, we have been working to help design and produce and to advise people to use ergonomic chairs, if you like. We are trying to, we would want people to have good supportive chairs that they can adjust to suit their personal needs for the jobs that they are doing. The fact that they are sufficiently comfortable that some people would choose to sit in them all day is not an ergonomic approach. What we would be suggesting is that we want you to be supportive when you're doing your work, but we also want you to have an ergonomic approach to the administrative side of your job as well as the physical, if you like. We want you to adjust your job so that you have a variety of postures, a variety of activities. It's vitally important uh, if you're going to follow an ergonomics approach to include those two elements in the design. Now, to overcome the, the, the supposed problem with having a comfortable chair that encourages you to sit supported all day and therefore not to, to move, if you like, um, people have been suggesting that we should be using this sort of chair. And it has some benefits, but because with the argument being that because you've got no backrest, you will be moving around and that in itself will be pumping the blood around the body. And that argument one, one can't fault, but there are some problems. Um, there has been some research recently done in Holland, I think, and it's found that in fact, the opposite may be happening in some of these situations. And um, This was a statement recently made by a, an eminent uh, human factor specialist in the States, in fact. And she said that the lack of stability of sitting on some seats, and she was meaning these ones that move around and don't have backrests, she, by looking at the research that's around and her, her own uh, research, the lack of stability of sitting on some of these seats can cause users to lock up their position, their posture. So that in fact when we're sitting on these, in order to hold us comfortably in the position we want to be, if you like, we tense up the muscles of the trunk. And that can have the opposite effect that we were trying to achieve. So there are a lot of barriers to overcome. And if we have a look at some of these with respect to the user, well, firstly, it may not occur to workers to think about adjusting the desk. We get stuck into the computer work and we forget that how the time is passing. We may be self-conscious about adjusting the desk. We don't want to be the person, the only person to be standing up at our workplace. We may not want to disturb our colleagues because in making that change, we may well um, interrupt the work that our colleagues are doing. We may feel that, well, is it really worth it? I don't really understand. What's the benefit of doing this? We need to include reasons for this in our training. When we're giving people perhaps display screen equipment training, we need to make sure that they understand the benefits of movement, of getting away from the desk, whether or not they've got a height adjustable desk, so that they can, when they are provided with the facilities, they can make use of them. There's also the case that appropriate footwear needs to be available for, particularly for the standing 
um, situation. So people need to have comfortable footwear that they can stand up uh, and work at the computer, at the desk, and so forth. Barriers that the employer has to overcome are certainly uh, to do with things as such as the cost, apparent high cost of the adjustable desk. Well, I'm not so sure that that is really really such a, a strong argument anymore, particularly if you're buying in bulk. They seem to be coming down to very reasonable levels. Uh, and the benefits that you get from having these, the improved, uh, increased efficiency and so forth, I would suggest are likely to outweigh um, those extra costs. Often employers think that it's not easy to change the work culture to get people to use these things, so they don't want to invest in these, this equipment and then people not to use it. Well, it certainly needs a wholesale buy-in. You need the top of the company to be supporting this move. You need the, everybody to be encouraged and trained uh, to, you, to use the equipment. Employers are worried about litigation risks, um, whether or not the system, that, that the, adjust, the high adjustable desk might collapse, um, the system might fail, or whether or not you might trap your fingers or your hands between you and the desk next to you. And one can understand the concerns that they might have there. Um, but that just needs a bit of thought in terms of how you lay out the desking. Also, there have been some managers that have uh, been a little bit resistant to the idea because of the non-uniform appearance of the work area. But I think that's somewhat um, uh, an inappropriate and uh, uh, argument to be making in this situation where clearly there is benefit to everybody as a result of having this facility. So how can we help people to overcome these problems? Well, try standing meetings for a start. Get people into the idea of how standing can be beneficial. You don't have to have a table, uh, as shown here necessarily, for these standing meetings. Just a clip, come into the room, have a clipboard, and the meeting will be over uh, much more quickly, be much more focused. That said, a standing meeting is not all appropriate for all types of meetings, and sometimes you will need um, chairs and indeed tables. But it's an idea to try and include this where appropriate. Walking meetings are often quite, or becoming more popular, and I know one company that has a walk and talk Wednesday or, or any, any day of the week. Now, uh, this may only be um, significant to people in the UK. I don't know how many foreign um, attendees we've got today, um, but this was the debate last night, and I'm not sure whether these people were having walking and talking uh, meetings, but uh, they were the three prospective candidates for Prime Minister in our election next week. Um, certainly walking about the stage and talking to the audience, um, and I think they certainly shed a few uh, pounds, perhaps, uh, in, in those debates we had last night. You could combine the two. You can have a, a treadmill conference room uh, where you can include uh, standing meetings as well as uh, a walking meeting. Um, I've said that I, I'm not particularly in favor of treadmill desk, and I, I certainly would, would um, reiterate that now um, because they, they, have, they come with their own particular risks, and they are also only appropriate for certain types of work. And I would rather see the same result achieved by other means than having this sort of facility. So to summarize some of the issues we've been talking about and the recommendations. Firstly, certainly interrupt the seated time with standing and with movement. Yes, if you've got a sit-stand desk, then that can be helpful. But you also need that movement, getting away from the desk just walking around the office floor, perhaps. Just to remember that exercising outside work time doesn't always, or is probably unlikely, to adequately compensate for prolonged seating periods at work. Don't just change the furniture. You've got to change the culture. Just changing the furniture, people might not use it at all or properly. Workers have to want to use it, want to do it. They have to be able to do it. And you have to explain the reasons for doing it, probably in training sessions, to make sure they understand the whys and the wherefores. All your work systems should be supportive. You should have company policies, I would suggest, that encourage people to, to use this equipment. 
your DSC assessments are going to have to need to address sit-stand furniture. Indeed, you're probably going to have to include in those DSC assessments the use of uh, things like tablets and laptops and so forth in your breakout areas. But I won't go uh, into that anymore now because, in fact, the next webinar coming up in a couple of weeks' time um, is going to deal with those issues. Perhaps drink, lo drink lots of water. At least it will cause you to have to go for more comfort breaks. And when you do go for those, use the stairs. Don't go up and down the floors in the lift, but go up and down in the stairs. Perhaps go up and down twice just to get the extra benefit. Stand in meetings if you can. They'll certainly be more focused uh, and probably a lot shorter for that reason. And standing episodes are said to be, or should be, longer than two minutes, certainly and perhaps up to 90 minutes. There's a lot of debate and uh, it depends entirely on the amount of activity that you include in your standing episode, if you like. But for me, certainly greater than two minutes, I would say five, ten minutes as a minimum, um, and up to 90 minutes. Some people would say only up to an hour or so. Some people would say two, three hours. Um, I think at the end of the day, it has to be down to the individual and what they feel comfortable with. So, okay, there we go. I think that's enough of the chat and perhaps to move on to if, if there are any questions. So back to you for the moment, Catherine. Thank you, John. Um, yes, I, mean, I have to say I was particularly um, impressed, I suppose, um, with, with your explanation of the risk and just really pointing out that we need to have it in proportion. Um, I think you know, knee-jerk reactions are often not terribly helpful, and I think we need to make sure we, we, we look at these things in perspective. Yeah. Something needs to be done, but it has to be right. Right, yeah. enough of me. Um, we have um, we had a request. Could you show that your slide with the British and European standard on it that you talked about? I think somebody wishes to take the reference down. So could you um, re-show that slide, please? You'd think I could, wouldn't you? I've got it hidden behind a load of other stuff. Let's see okay. where that one was. Yeah, it was uh, 1999. I'll, I'll, I'll keep searching for it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Whilst you're, whilst you're searching, can you put your mind to... We've had a question as to do we think with this sort of new way of working that um, web-based DSE e-learning is still suitable? Sorry, I was trying to say so web-based DSE learning is... Is that still suitable with these changing ways of working and trying to um, promote sort of movement and um, sit-stand type things? That's an interesting question, isn't it? Um, I can't... I, I, I suppose it's going back to the old argument where way back when the DSE regs came in when we said, well, by doing online assessment... Um, is keeping people at the computer and I suppose this is the same argument becoming more so um, because we're encouraging people even uh, well, to, to, even when they're standing at their workstation to stay at the workstation in a sense. Um, yes, I think it is appropriate because as it, as it has always been, if you don't have this sort of system then out of, of doing uh, the training and indeed the assessment then many companies won't be providing this or they won't have the resources to provide it in as effective a manner as, as it is. And whilst I, I can understand the arguments uh, for caution, um, I still think it is an appropriate way of doing the, the training and assessment. Um, that said, if you've got the resources to have one-to-one -one training and one-to-one -one assessment, then great. But that is not the case for the majority of companies uh, in the current financial situation. And if I can just add to that, to or uh, the about the um, British standard, um, I can't. Well, we can that's make something sure. that generally we'll make sure with the on. new systems, that can be brought up to date so quickly. Sorry? Are you there, Kevin? Yes, I am. I think we've got a bit of a bit of a, a, a delay on the line. I apologise for that. Right. Um, can I ask you another um, question? 
Yes, I don't know why. Yeah, yes. Um, Swiss balls. What do we feel about the current trend for Swiss balls in the office in relation to movement? Uh, this again has been an, a, uh, an argument that's been in the um, well in the in the ergonomics world for a long time now. My own personal view is that we shouldn't be using them unless there's a, um, a there's been advice from the the sort of treating professional. Um, there are too many problems. Um, firstly, whether or not the ball is the right size for the individual, whether it's inflated in the right way. When people move in and out from the desk, you inevitably um, change the height that you're actually sitting at because you're rolling on top of the ball, and that can cause problems. And from the very start, there have been the straightforward, the very obvious risks from using such a device because of the the potential if you do fall off or or whatever you might bang your head or whatever on on a piece of the furniture. So generally, unless there's been a specific recommendation from your physio or your doctor, then I would say that these are not really the way forward. I know there's a lot of people who advocate them um, and uh, like the idea, and I can understand the benefits that are being argued in terms of core strength and maintenance of uh, a better upper body posture, but if that ends up that people are misusing them and not sitting in the correct posture or not managing to maintain that correct posture for very long, then that actually leads to a greater problem than they would have had if they'd sat in a uh, even a poor a poor chair. Thank you. I just I've got a further follow up question from that. Um, asking what a Swiss ball is. Um, just to let you know, a Swiss ball is a large inflatable ball that people use for exercise, like a Pilates ball. Um, so it's uh, it's one of the exercise balls. Um, if you're unaware about that. Um, staying on on this type of area, um, any advice about pregnancy and using sit stand desks, John? Again, not one I've particularly thought about before, but I can't see, uh, again, I, I go back to my point about people making the change between sitting and standing uh, in accordance with their own comfort and needs. Now, I, I think that is particularly uh, appropriate for, um, uh, for in pregnancy. Um, now, it may be that the pregnant lady stands further away from the keyboard and so forth, but that's no different to if you were sitting down. So I don't think the, the adjustable desk um, brings with it any additional problems. I think it brings with, a lot, brings with it a lot more freedom and control of the working posture for that person. And if, when they're also changing the height of the desk, they get up and go for a walk, um, then so much the better, but only to the extent that they want to, that they feel comfortable. So uh, I think it's it's probably an advantage to them. Okay. Well, I think, John, we're, we're running out of time, I'm afraid, there. Can so I, I think, can I, sorry, quickly, carry on. Can I quickly give you the, the reference? I can't seem to get the slide up on the screen, but it was British Standard, BSEN, British Standard European Norm, and then ISO, International Standards Organization. So it's a BS standard 9241-5-1999. Now that has been, uh, there are standards dealing with these things which have been uh, updated or later than that. But the one that I was talking about there was the 9241 uh, published in 1999. Right, we'll also put that on the question and answers when we put them up on the website, so we'll make sure that that reference is clearly available to people um, after this, but that probably won't be till next week. Right, John, thank you very much for that, and as I said, all the questions and answers will be uh, put up on the website um, afterwards with the recording. I'd like just to let you know that our next webinar um, in this series is on the 15th of May and it's Mobile DSC Ergonomics by Matthew Bertels from the Health and Safety Labs. This should be a, a very interesting and actually a very important uh, webinar, I think, to many of us who are struggling with the way people work now, both using mobile equipment and in a flexible way. So I would uh, strongly advise, if you can, to listen in. We'd like to hear you.
I think that's really all for us now, and I'd really just like to say thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoy the bank holiday weekend with John's words ringing in your mind about lots of